Hey guys, uh, I'm Camilo. For those of you that don't know me, I'm one of the new EM interns. And today for my small talk, I'm gonna be talking about TTP in the ED with a clinical presentation of a patient. Um, before I start, I wanna shout out the small talks team, Dr. Turner, Dr. Kopchak, and Dr. Chu uh, for helping me with this presentation. Um, so we're gonna start off, it's a 47 year old female, basically no significant past medical history, presenting with dyspnea and exertion uh, with some associated chest tightness, palpitations, and just like overall fatigue and uh, decrease in exercise tolerance for two weeks. Um, associated with that, she has some uh, headaches that she describes for two weeks, kind of left side of temporal headache, pounding in nature uh, on and off, but basically present all day. Denies any, any neck stiffness, but does have some photophobia, no weakness, no numbness anywhere. On review system, she denies any fevers, chills, cough, uh, melanoma, blood per rectum, lower extremity swelling, or calf tenderness. Uh, she also denies any recent like weight loss uh, or any weight gain. On exam, her vital signs are stable. She's a febrile. Her blood pressure is 147 over 86. Her heart rate is 86, and she's setting 100%. On general exam, there's no neck rigidity, uh, there's no focal neurological deficits, and overall, the rest of her exam is benign. Um, so kind of with that very simple presentation um, and kind of what you heard from the patient, like what would be your differentials at this point? We usually start making differentials off of a cheap complaint, so I'm sure we have some at this point. <laughs> it's very astute. Yes, TTP. Any other ones? Yeah, so these were my differentials. I originally, when I first saw this patient, um, even though she wasn't my patient, I was interested because she was in our pod. Um, I was thinking malignancy versus like an anemia versus PE or like an ACS picture. So kind of very vague. Uh, and when you kind of have a very vague presentation, you kind of just draw basic labs and kind of see if you could get an answer from that. So that's exactly what we did. Um, so these were our labs. So from here, you could see, uh, from the CBC, she has an anemia of 5.9, and the double exclamation points are pointing you to the platelet count of 10,000. Uh, her comp shows a creatinine of 1.11, BUN of 24, no known renal history, but unknown baseline, uh, a total billy of 1.6, and the morphology uh, that we got was moderate schistocytes. Um, so at this point, we're kind of freaking out. We didn't I was clearly not expecting TTP in this patient, but we were expecting something more common. Uh, TTP is really rarely seen, at least uh, based on the literature. Obviously, this is the first patient I've ever seen. So now we have some new differentials. So based on the basic labs that we just saw, she has some sort of uh, hemolytic anemia with thrombocytopenia. So it's a, our new differentials now are TTP, HUS versus DIC, uh, which is kind of the umbrella term for our Maha uh, pathologies. Um, so I needed an approach to kind of uh, differentiate uh, our patient from whether having DIC versus TTP. I made this very simple uh, flow chart, which took me way longer than it should have. Um, but at the start, we have our patient who is thrombocytopenic with a platelet count of 10,000 and hemolytic anemia on the basic labs. Um, so my next question was, okay, I have to differentiate DIC versus TTP and HUS and but my next question was, does our patient have an elevated T PT, PTT with low fibrinogen count? If she does, then she'll go uh, in the DIC section because it's a consumptive coagulopathy, uh, which causes our elevated PT, PTT due to activation of the extrinsic uh, coagulation cascade. If the answer to that question is no, then she's under TTP or HUS, which are often clumped together because they present very similarly. But usually uh, HUS is a pediatric population which has like a diarrheal prodrome or bloody diarrhea that then present two weeks later with like an anemic type picture. TTP is kind of our patient, very vague. Um, for those of you that don't appreciate a good flow sheet, this is the table that I use to uh, get my information from, uh, but it basically tells you the same information that my flow sheet gives you. Um, I like flow sheets. Uh, so back to our patient. So we got the necessary lab values at this point. We added some on. Uh, so you can see from our COAC panel, she has a normal PT, PTT, and a normal INR. Her haptoglobin was less than 10. LDH was elevated at 955, and she has a normal fibrinogen count. So to show you that my flow sheet worked, uh, the thrombocytopenia with hemolytic anemia with normal PT, PTT, with, low fibrin with a normal fibrinogen count, uh, put her in the TTP category. So at this point, TTP uh, is usually uh, 
classically taught as a pentad. Uh, so you have your five symptoms of fever, thrombocytopenia, renal failure, neurological findings, and anemia. In this case, uh, hemolytic anemia. So if we think back to our patient, she fit into four out of five. Uh, she has the thrombocytopenia with the anemia, the renal failure with a creatinine of 1.1 based on the fact that we don't know uh, a baseline, and she had the neuro neurological findings of headache with photophobia. Um, she did not have the fever. So the literature actually shows that less than 10% of patients that are diagnosed with TTP are found to be uh, febrile at presentation. Um, also, a third of patients with TTP have any neurological, neurological findings at presentation as well. And the overall uh, amount of patients that present with the classic pentad as it's taught is less than 5%. Uh, here is just a quick diagram to show you the pathophysiology of uh, TTP, which is just basically uh, loss of Adams TS13, lead, leading to the failure to cleave von Willebrand factor monomers, leading to uh, platelet aggregation and, uh, and activation, leading to ischemic flow downstream. So now that we have our diagnosis of TTP for our patient, <clears throat> we have to start thinking of our management. So what it's the, what's like the classic board style answer to this question. Plasma. Yeah, plasmapheresis. So it's our gold standard. Uh, plasmapheresis is gonna be the answer for most of our board questions. That's just what you do. You, you diagnose TTP, so you have to start plasmapheresis. The one thing that I found that is, while plasmapheresis sounds very nice, uh, it's kind of very hard to do uh, in real life. So plasmapheresis, for example, for our patient uh, required four, uh, she was around 90 kilos in size and she required four uh, liters of fresh frozen plasma to be transfused every single day in order to be uh, have an effective uh, <clears throat> a treatment plan. So four liters of fresh frozen plasma translates to about like eight to 12 units of FFP which is a lot. So one thing that we considered in the ED was placing a central line or a Shiley in order to uh, help the ICU team, which is where her eventual dispo is gonna be uh, in order to have a, a line for all this, uh, this high amount of volume. Um, the other thing that we considered in the ED was uh, contacting the blood bank because this is a patient's gonna be very resource intensive requiring 12 units of FFP uh, every single day. And we were unsure how long her stay was gonna be. Uh, other things just to talk about uh, management, uh, some new uh, present data that's been shown is that uh, the adjunct of corticosteroids is actually beneficial. So the ISTH, which is the International Society of Thrombosis and Hematology, uh, came out with some guidelines saying that uh, the first guideline was, yes, you could add on uh, corticosteroids, but the data for around the TTP and the corticosteroids is not that well established. It's a pretty rare disease and it's pretty hard to find patients to actually do a study on, but their basic, uh, their basic understanding was there's low risk to adding on steroids and there's there could be a high benefit. Uh, there are some other studies showing that rituximab can be beneficial, especially in preventing relapse of patients that uh, are diagnosed with TTP. And there is a new monoclonal antibody called Clabazizumab, that's uh, specifically a monoclonal antibody to von Willebrand factor that has also shown to be effective. Um, so seeing this patient, seeing the fact that she's uh, thrombocytopenic and anemic, one concern that I had uh, and one hesitation that I had in the ED was uh, having a platelet, uh, basically inserting a pretty uh, large catheter into a large vein. So every time that I've done a central, uh, central line, which is been twice now. Uh, it's always pretty bloody. Uh, it might just be me, but uh, I, thinking about a patient that already doesn't have that much blood and doesn't have platelets to kind of help with uh, coagulation and stopping the bleeding, I was like, are we sure we want to transfer? Uh, we want to place a large uh, central line in this patient. So I did some studying just because this is a question that I had. Um, there's not much literature on it, but I did find this retrospective study, uh, which looked at 55 patients with TTP with an average uh, platelet count around 14,000, uh, 12 of which received a platelet transfusion prior uh, to uh, getting the central line placed, and the rest of which did not get a platelet transfusion. Uh, what they found was that the levels of minor bleeding, which they defined as bleeding that stopped with no intervention, was about equal in both groups. So in the, in the group that got transfused, it was around 28%, and the group that did not was 35%. They also had a secondary uh, 
definition of major bleeding, which was just uh, bleeding that required some uh, direct pressure in order to stop the bleeding. Um, and it was only seen in the group that wasn't transfused, but uh, only three patients required it. So I wouldn't really call uh, major bleeding uh, bleeding that stops after some gentle pressure. So uh, I didn't think that was too significant for our patient. Um, so that's kind of uh, my patient there and kind of the questions that I have. So I'm gonna start with a review question uh, for everyone. So this is our first patient. A uh, 45-year-old woman presents with fatigue and shortness of breath for the past three days. Uh, physical exam reveals pale conjunctiva and scleral icterus and scattered purpur on her legs. Lab findings, white count six, uh, hemoglobin of nine and plate with 15,000. Uh, peripheral blood smear reveals schistocytes. On further questioning, she notes a couple recent episodes of headache with transient blurry vision. What's the most effective treatment? Yeah, plasmapheresis. So like I said, it's gonna be our gold standard. Even though corticosteroids can be an adjunct, plasmapheresis is gonna be, is gonna be your main, uh, your, your main uh, treatment for these patients. Uh, the mortality of not treating patients in the first 24 hours with plasmapheresis is around 80%. And even with plasmapheresis, it only drops to around 10%, which I think is still pretty high. Uh, you can transfuse red blood cells as well as platelets, but uh, the literature kind of says that it's more like adding uh, wood to a fire. Uh, the pathophysiology is activation of platelets inappropriately, uh, as well as the shearing of red blood cells. So even if you transfuse it, it's kind of like putting a Band-Aid on a, on, a on a huge wound. So it's not, it's not really beneficial. Um, this is my last uh, review question. So a 22-year-old visibly pregnant female presents with a nosebleed confusion and a rash on her trunk and lower extremities. She can't provide additional history because of her confusion and is ill appearing and has the following labs. So we see a white count of 18,000, a hemoglobin of 8.2, platelets of 12,000, D-dimer that is normal at 100, PTT that is also normal at 60 seconds, a normal INR or slightly elevated at 1.7 and a normal fibrinogen. So what are we diagnosing her with? Yeah, E, so uh, TTP. So in case you didn't believe in my, in my uh, flow sheet, uh, she does have the thrombocytopenia, the anemia, which just, uh, which uh, I believe they didn't say it was just size. That was the last question. But if you look at her PTT, it's normal with a normal INR and fibrinogen. So if we use my old trusty uh, flow sheet, we see that we come to the conclusion of TTP. Um, as you see, there is the uh, DIC is an option. So I, uh, it could very easily be confused between the two. Uh, the other ones are kind of don't really fit the picture here. Um, so three takeaways from my presentation. Uh, TTP can be very insidious. It kind of just presents as someone that with very vague symptoms and usually at the end of the day, it's gonna be a lab diagnosis more than a clinical finding that you see. Um, I talked about the approach to differentiating the different types of MAHA with my flow sheet. And uh, we talked about the fact that even though it's classically taught, the pentad is very rare to find and only less than 5% of patients actually present that way. Plasmapheresis, your gold standard. It's a little bit more complicated in real life, but that's gonna be your answer for the boards. And last but not least, don't be afraid to place that central line uh, in the patient that's thrombocytopenic and anemic because that's most likely what's gonna save them. And these are my references.